Welcome everyone to Have History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and last week's episode saw Claiborne make it to the Chickamauga battlefield late on September 19th, when General Daniel Harvey Hill ordered his division to launch an assault against the Union forces to inflict as much damage as possible before nightfall. Claiborne assembled his division with Wood's Brigade in the center, Polk's on the right, and Deschler's on the left. The division pressed onward through the ranks of Liddell's division, who gave them a cheer as they passed by. Claiborne took up a position right behind Wood's line so that he could monitor the situation most effectively. The wings of the division moved through thick woods, but the center advanced through an open field. In that open ground, Claiborne commented that for half an hour the fire was the heaviest I had ever heard. The darkness and smoke made the musketry inaccurate. Many of the men simply aimed at the muzzle flashes of the enemy rifles. A member of his staff described Claiborne in the situation. I never saw Claiborne before or afterward so demonstrative. I suppose knowing it was indispensable that the charge should be successful and reflecting that his men had not seen a regular battle for nine months, he deemed it necessary to encourage them as much as possible. Wood's brigade in the center, with lack of protection from the trees and hesitant to move forward without support on their flanks, called several halts and were slow in moving against the enemy. Claiborne ordered up his artillery under Major Hotchkiss and placed the cannon 60 yards from the Union infantry and opened with double canister. The blue troops fled and the Confederate division pursued, capturing three artillery pieces and two regimental colors. It was 9 p.m. and it became impossible to press the attack further. Hanley, one of Claiborne's staff members, rode up to a group of officers to deliver orders, but overheard them call out an order to an Indiana regiment. Hanley had unwittingly rode into Union lines. Quickly, he wheeled his horse around and rode back into his lines without being discovered. Claiborne's men camped on the land they had conquered that night, without fires, although some did light them. Federal sharpshooters used the fire to pick their targets and send the gray troops running. In morbid fashion, the division slept on the cold ground in damp clothes from crossing the Chickamauga with dead Union soldiers. A couple of the men used the dead as pillows. During the night, Claiborne and his men heard the crack of axe blades against trees and they knew that the next morning attack would involve overcoming federal entrenchments. Behind the lines and thick foliage, Claiborne allowed a fire to be built at division headquarters. As he sat with his staff around it, some of the division officers brought in a captured lieutenant. Claiborne interrogated him as to the disposition of the Union Army, but the lieutenant wouldn't speak. Claiborne told the Confederate officer to take the prisoner away, and before he left the fire, the officer asked the lieutenant if he had anything to eat. The Federal said yes. The Confederate officer sighed and said he hadn't. The lieutenant said that there was some hardtack and other food in his haversack. The officer in charge of the prisoner and those soldiers who had made the capture scrambled for the food and began to bicker over who had the right to it. Claiborne intervened and said that it should be left up to the prisoner. The Union lieutenant said he would rather keep it. Claiborne gave a small smile and returned to the fire. Dawn emerged and Claiborne, Breckenridge, and Hill convened. They directed the men to draw rations and cook breakfast. A courier rode to the three men and said he was from General Polk and handed Claiborne and Breckenridge orders that said to attack the enemy when ready. The courier added verbally that it was supposed to be a dawn attack. By that point, that was out of the question as dawn had already passed. Hill wanted to know why Polk was ordering his divisions forward, bypassing the chain of command. The courier explained that no one could find Hill the night before and decided to order the divisions in by order of General Bragg. The courier left and Polk arrived. Claiborne told him that they would move out as soon as the men ate. Polk acted as though the attack was nothing expedient and rode off. Next, Bragg approached and he chastised Hill for his absence the night before and for not ordering the dawn attack. Nevertheless, a dawn attack was out of the question. At 9.30 a.m., Claiborne ordered his men forward. Polk's brigade on the right was supposed to keep contact with Breckenridge's division, which made the brigade move farther north, exposing the right flank of Wood's brigade. Polk's men made it to within 175 yards of the Union line when canister fire ripped into their ranks. They didn't go much further. Wood's men lay prone on the ground, unable to budge the well-fortified Union forces, and Deschler's men on the left were mixed in with Stewart's division and couldn't get untangled. Claiborne went to Deschler and sorted out the units. Stuart agreed to attack in tandem with Claiborne, but the Confederate regiments threw themselves against a greatly entrenched foe. Claiborne had no choice but to pull back. 
Deschler covered the withdrawal and remained within sight of the Federal guns from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. During that time, as Deschler paced up and down the line encouraging his men to keep their heads down but not to run, an artillery shell ripped him in half. At 3.30, Polk ordered Claiborne to move to the right to join Breckinridge as they assaulted George Thomas's line. The Union general was in the process of a staged withdrawal when Claiborne's men attacked at about 5 p.m. Earlier, General James Longstreet's men had busted through the Union Center, and Thomas's men were some of the last holdouts of the Union line. Claiborne himself led an artillery battery to the precise location he wanted the cannons to be positioned, and directed its fire 60 yards away from the blue troops. One Confederate commented that the artillery scattered death and destruction into the ranks of the Federals. His infantry then moved in and captured the works, along with hundreds of prisoners and three artillery pieces. Hill called off pursuing the Federals, thinking it too dangerous to pursue so close to night. Exhausted, Claiborne's men bivouacked for the night where they stood. Out of the 5,115 men in the division, 1,743 were killed or wounded, or one out of every three. Only six appeared to be missing. It had been a bloody and brutal battle for Claiborne and his division, but the divisional commander had emerged unscathed. Bragg did not follow up on his victory the next day as Union troops streamed over Lookout Mountain. He had reports from Nathan Bedford Forrest that Chattanooga was being evacuated and thus moved his army in that direction, but when he arrived he found that the Union army were digging in and fortifying the city. On September 24th, Claiborne was tasked with testing the Union lines and found that it was a formidable defense. Bragg decided not to attack and resolved to lay siege to the city.